if you're a guy who can score a 150 on an IQ test, but you live in a basement and all you do is yell about how unfortunate you are all day, actually, you are not very smart in an important way. You can take good multiple choice questions, but something has gone wrong in your life and you've been unable to unravel that. And that's what happened to that one guy who sometimes goes as like the smartest man in the world. It just seems like the smartest man in the world should be able to like get a bank loan. Dude, I love your Substack. Your Substack was one of my <laughs> favorite finds throughout all of last year. It's absolutely phenomenal. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you to say. Congratulations, man. What's your background? Who are you? What do you do? Um, I'm trained as a psychologist in social psychology. So the kind of psychology that I can't help people directly, but I can certainly write papers about them. Uh, so that's what I got my PhD in a couple of years ago. Uh, right now, um, I'm like finishing up a job where I teach uh, negotiation to business students. Uh, but mainly what I do is write that Substack. You made the decision to go full-time or more serious partway through last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically I got tired of writing papers that nobody reads where you basically have to lie to get them published. And I thought, why not just write what really happened in my studies uh, or what's really going on in my head uh, on the internet? And I thought maybe nobody would listen. And then people started listening. Uh, and then they started shouting at me. And that's another story. What? What was that thing that you pirated? You pirated a study, did it yourself, and just published it and said, sort of, stuck a middle finger up at the usual journal yeah. submission process. Yeah, I was running these studies with a friend of mine on basically what happens when you ask people how things could be different. And, you know, they write out their answers and we're like, okay, if it was different in that way, how much better or worse would it be? Uh, and they would tell us. And and so we had like eight studies investigating this question of, of this this bias in human imagination. And we were writing, trying to write it up for a scientific journal. And we felt like we couldn't do it without lying. Like things like we forgot why we ran study eight. This happens sometimes. You're working on a bunch of projects. You look back and like, wait, why did we do that? Like the results are interesting. But now I can't reconstruct how we got to the point where we ran study eight. And I was like, Ethan, my co-author, I was like, what should we do and we were like what if we just told the truth uh and just like wrote it ourselves and put it on the internet and so we we're like hey guys here's study eight we don't remember why we ran it if you can figure it out why don't you write to us and people really did which is the best part um <laughs> so yeah so we just wrote it honestly and put it on the internet which is uh the way i intend to do science going forward and you got shouted at by people on the internet twice yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so not so much for that. People seem to be cool with that. Although some people are like, science is very serious and there shouldn't be jokes. And I'm like, man, who killed your fun? Uh, but then I wrote an article about peer review, which is this process that scientific papers are supposed to undergo before they're published. Um, and basically why it's a failed experiment. Um, and I had someone in the comments being like, uh, Adam, do you still work at uh, at this this dorm I used to work at when I was in, in graduate school? Uh, like, I have serious doubts about your ability to mentor undergraduates. Like, this is very serious. I'm a Harvard alum, which is where that dorm was that I, that I worked. Um, and this person was a tenured professor at Boston University. I was like, man, so people got nothing better to do than, uh, than yell at, at random people on the internet. Um, fortunately, she was a little out of date. I don't work there anymore. Um, you got but, accused of cynical metacognitive polywaffle yeah yeah <laughs> does that describe do you think that describes your approach accurately uh yes it describes it to a point <laughs> um yeah some people just get really mad especially when you uh criticize the the ladders basically that they've climbed up um and when you go hey it seems like these systems don't actually do the things that people claim that they do th they go uh, uh yes they do and also you're a big meanie <laughs> Well, I mean, if you've spent most of your career playing the rules of a game and somebody else comes and says, have we ever considered whether we could just change these rules? Because they kind of seem a little bit dumb. I, quite yeah. rightly, people are going to seem pretty threatened. But the bottom line is it doesn't seem like a particularly effective way to play the game, at least given the outcomes that they are purported to be trying to get. Yeah, exactly. That uh, that if it's so good for papers to undergo this process that we call peer review, then you should be able to like tell the difference between the papers that do and the papers that don't. You should be able to see like, oh, yeah, reviewers actually catch big errors and they don't. Uh, you should hear lots of stories that like, yeah, man, this guy tried to submit a paper to a journal and the reviewers like caught on that he was faking his data and now he got fired. You never hear a story like that. Th those stories always begin with, yeah, this guy published 60 papers, 60 peer reviewed papers and journals. And then someone was like, wait, should we check the data? And then they did. And it turned out it was all made up. And then the guy got fired. 
Uh, and so when you have a system that works like that, but it takes 15,000 person years of labor every year uh, to make it go, maybe that's a system that like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe we should try to think about other things. I'm not even saying everybody should do what I did. Uh, this is what works for me. Um, like I like writing papers in my own voice and giving them direct to people. Some people like this system. Great. They should do it, but they shouldn't force other people at gunpoint to do it as well. Why aren't smart people happier? <laughs> Uh, I think it is because our uh, definition of intelligence and the way that we test it carves off one part of what a human mind can do and then basically claims that that is everything that a human mind can do. So when you take an intelligence test, you're basically taking a standardized test, a bunch of multiple choice questions. Um, and, and it turns out that like your ability to take those questions actually does matter. So a lot of people want to pretend that like, oh, we're not measuring anything there. We really do. Like it, this is related to some of your life outcomes, your, your ability to, to get and to hold certain jobs. But what it turns out to not be related to, it has no correlation with, uh, how satisfied you say you are with your life. Um, which is of course a key problem that people are trying to solve. And so it suggests that like your abil ability to like, do those anagrams and like solve these logic problems and do reading comprehension questions is unrelated to your ability to like make choices in your life that when you look back, you go, oh, those are the right choices. I feel good about those choices that I made. And I think a great example of this is like there are people who score extremely high on IQ tests who make extremely stupid decisions. Uh, I mean, every year you hear about professors, you know, are like, oh, man, they like couldn't keep their hands to themselves and they sexually harassed a bunch of people and now they're fired. That just seems like, not, I mean, an immoral thing to do, but also a really dumb thing to do. And so you'd think if these people uh, can ace these tests, that they would also be able to not make very stupid, obvious mistakes. Wasn't so that's a, why I think, yeah. there was some guy that you looked at who was adamant that banks weren't giving him bank account because he was white. And yeah. then Bobby Fischer, this sort of chess prodigy, <laughs> yeah. just started going on about the Jews. Again, you know, yeah. you, you can argue over the veracity of their argument. The point is, if you're a super genius investment advisor to somebody or the number one chess prodigy in the world, don't talk about the Jews <laughs> in, if you want to keep your job and be yeah. surprised. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a guy who can, you know, score a 150 on an IQ test, but you live in a basement and all you do is yell about how unfortunate you are all day, it just seems to me like actually you, you are not very smart in an important way. Like you could take good multiple choice questions, but something has gone wrong in your life and you've been unable to unravel that. Uh, and that's what happened to that one guy who's who sometimes goes as like the smartest man in the world. Um, it just seems like the smartest man in the world should be able to like get a bank loan, um, which is a, th a thing that people do every day. Uh, you don't have to be a genius to do it. You just gotta like have some good credit and like explain what you want for it. Uh, but like this guy can't do it. Does that mean that smart people are more miserable, or is there no correlation between intelligence and happiness? Yeah, no correlation. So this has been found across study that did some of this analysis myself. Um, it seems like there's either no correlation or a very tiny one uh, that can easily go in either direction. So it's also not that like, oh, have, like having all this brain power makes you less happy. It just seems to be that there are these these problems in life that are different from the ones that we test when we test people's intelligence. What are the wrong theories that smart people have about what's going to make them happy in life? <laughs> uh, I think it is, oh, I'll just get like, this really prestigious job and I'll just make lots of money and then like question mark, question mark, question mark, I'll be content and feel good about myself. Um, and uh, I mean, all you need to do is look around uh, and like actually get to know some of the people who have accomplished those things. Uh, and quite often they feel like, oh, well, no, there's this other thing I just need to do and like then I'll be happy. Um, and, and most often, I mean, the people, like the best predictor that we have of happiness is the quality of your social relationships. Um, and uh, and it turns out that like, yeah, those can sometimes suffer if the thing that you are maximizing is uh, the title of your job or the size of your bank account. I wonder whether smart people get captured or caught up in those sorts of games more readily than people who are less smart. Perhaps they have more opportunities and doorways that are open to them or something like that. Yeah, it's easy to like see the game being played and get really good at playing the game. Um, because if you're good at acing these tests, you're probably good at game playing. And then a mistake playing the game for living a meaningful and satisfying life. Uh, that, you know, you could spend your whole life doing it and just feel like, ah, but if I could just do better at the game, if I could just acquire more Monopoly money, uh, then like at some point I start feeling good. Uh, and the thing about Monopoly money is it's fake. <laughs> there is no amount that you could have before you feel good. 
There was a, a quote from a friend who uh, I, I really reflected on a lot last year, and I realized that we trade the thing that we want, which is time, for the thing which is supposed to get it, money. We also trade the thing which we want, which is happiness, for the thing which is supposed to get it, success. We give up time to make money so that we can finally have more time when we have enough money. We give up happiness to achieve success so that we can finally have more happiness when we achieve enough success. Like, it's so... It was that Japanese fisherman proverb thing about the American businessman that goes to the Japanese fisherman and says you could make a fish market and build this big business up and then eventually you'd just be able to fish on the on the lake all day. And it does feel a lot of the time, especially now, man, because my background's in the productivity world, at least when I started mm-hmm. this show. And coming out of that it does make me think that so much over-optimization has led people to get themselves into a situation where this treadmill this ever speeding up treadmill of success to beget happiness which doesn't because the sacrifice of happiness is in the the achievement of the success for the happiness yeah it's very self-defeating yeah uh it's weird that it is so hard that it is so self-defeating in that way you'd think that this would all be very obvious it's just like i know the things that make me feel good and i should just do more of those things and not make me feel good in in like the most basic way i mean some of those things but make me feel good in like that, that deep like meaningful way that that i like but instead we have extremely strong theories about what will do that for us that somehow seem like very hard to disconfirm they're just like ah just a little bit more and, and then i'll have it i mean i feel this in my own life that um it can be hard to actually tell what you like doing if you have a very strong theory about what you should like doing. So when I was writing those scientific papers, I was like, yeah, no, I, I, I like this. Like, this is good. And um, and before I start doing it, I just need to like drink a lot of caffeine, hit a Pomodoro timer, like turn off my phone, like turn off the internet uh, and then like make myself do it for 25 minutes and only then can I take a break. And I was like, wait, that, why would I have to do all these things for a thing that I supposedly like doing? The things I like doing, I just do them and I don't want to stop and I don't need to be managed into doing them. Um, and so there's something I think very weird and unexplained here about how very strong theories of happiness can mislead you into spending a lot of time making yourself unhappy. That's a really interesting point, a very profound point, I think, actually, where much of what we take pleasure from, it's very difficult to separate out in the liquid how much of this is self-generated, stuff that I love and enjoy, and how much of this is social norms, biological predisposition, path of least resistance, way that I've dealt with past trauma, you know, pick your filter that you're making your behavior occur through. Uh, uh, Filling my sense of insufficiency for today, compensating for my sense of insufficiency that lags over from yesterday, whatever it might be. Um, Yeah, so so many things that we do are compensatory in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's weird how, how you could spend a lot of time, like hanging out with friends that you don't really like, uh, like working hard to like be promoted at a job that you don't really enjoy. Um, and I think it really takes paying very close attention to your experiences to be like, wait, what do I actually feel like when I'm doing these things? Um, and if it's not good, like, why am I fighting so hard to continue to do them? Um, I used to have this conversation a lot when I was uh, like a resident advisor in in undergrad and graduate school. So I talked to students a lot about like what they like to do. And uh, and often it was really hard for them because they had gotten to like these elite educational institutions in part by tamping down on the part of themselves that like enjoy doing things for the sake of doing them. And instead being really good at, at, at like convincing themselves that they enjoy doing the things that got them rewards and got them admission into Princeton and Harvard and places like that. Um, and it was really sad to watch it because it's like they had lost the ability to like feel true pleasure. Uh, and we're just like, I enjoy doing the things that like increase my CV. I'm like, man, you don't <laughs> and like you're, that's going to collapse it on itself eventually. What is a smarter way for smart people to become happy then? Uh, I think it is paying that close attention to like when I feel that sense, that thing that I like to feel uh, it's not just purely the pleasure of like, I, you know, I took a lick of ice cream. It is the pleasure of I feel fulfilled. I feel meaningful. Like, what is it you're doing when you're doing that? Because uh, everybody feels it at some point. Um, and maybe in those times you haven't given yourself the permission to feel that way um, because the thing that you're doing isn't something that's prestig- prestigious enough or you think it doesn't pay enough. I have a friend of mine who literally what he would love to do is uh, campground maintenance. 
This guy wants to dig ditches, hang hammocks, like he wants to mend fences. Um, and he knows he likes doing it and like he likes to work on his house. And instead, like he's a uh, um, like a, a computer engineer um, because like that pays more. He doesn't really like doing it. And I just want to take him aside and be like, dude, this is a job that people have. Like you can make money like you not as much money, but just think of all the hours of your life you're going to spend doing the thing that you don't like. To, to like dig <laughs> dig ditches in your own time like you can dig yeah. ditches during the day dude. <laughs> yeah, i'm a i'm a hobby dig ditcher ditch ditch digger yeah um i have a friend yeah. a friend who's got an unbelievably successful youtube channel millions and millions of, of subscribers huge business off the back of it and he spends all of his time in a really nice apartment out in california with a bunch of his other friends filming dungeons and dragons role play you know the the board game thing but one yeah. of them's a storyteller yeah. and it's sort of narrated yeah. and th- this isn't i don't even know if it's on the internet i think that they just <laughs> they he's got a good amount of disposable income i guess but yeah that's what he's chosen to spend his time doing yeah you know you're sending through the troposphere of all of the different problems you need to in terms of resource acquisition and then at the age of 33 retired to be a professional <laughs> dungeons and dragons master or whatever it is that he does yeah, good for him. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people put in all those years and don't get to don't get that uh, retirement at the end, or it comes much later. Yes. Uh, yeah. Speaking of the world of productivity, it's like I say, a world that I was very familiar with for a long time and yeah. still am. What is your issue with eating frogs? <laughs> yeah. So I wrote this post uh, about this idea, that, like there's this productivity system called like eat that frog or whatever. Basically, the thing you want to do the least, do that first. Um, which that in itself is not crazy, whatever. We've all had to do stuff that we don't want to do. If you do it immediately, you know, you cut down on the time that you spend dreading doing it. I think that's not the problem. I think the problem is feeling like there is something noble and natural in spending a lot of time eating frogs or eating a lot of them. Um, and I think that comes from this theory that we have about the way that we are naturally, which is that people feel like, oh, deep down, I'm actually a lazy piece of garbage. Like if left to my own devices, I will sit motionless and watch Netflix and play video. I will do all of these things that like uh, are not actually good. Um, and only by like whipping my unconscious self, like my natural self into shape, will I like become this person who does the things that are productive and good. And I think that actually comes from a lifetime of having to force yourself to do those things and then convince yourself that is the good self. Um, I think that's wrong. I think actually like our unconscious selves uh, uh, are pretty smart. I think they uh, they tend to be pretty well attuned to like things that are valuable. And it only feels like our natural inclinations are toward laziness because uh, our unconscious self only alerts our conscious self like when there's some kind of issue, like when something needs to be done. Uh, and so I have this metaphor in the, in the piece of like, if you hire an, in, an intern and tell that intern like, hey, just go do the tasks and then just like come to me if you ever have a problem. Whenever they, if you just ignore them when they're doing the tasks, but pay attention to them when they have the problem, you will assume that like, man, this intern doesn't do anything. They just come to me all the time, not paying attention to all the stuff that intern is doing when you're not looking. And that is what your unconscious self is doing. Um, and so I, I think you can get this totally wrong theory about what you would do when you were left to do whatever you want to do um, based on like the wrong uh, impression of how your unconscious self works. Why do you think it is that we have this puritan self-flagellation like uh, secret autoerotica thing going on <laughs> part of it i i think not to be too conspiratorial but i think this works really well for the people who are trying to squeeze labor out of us dude uh, i'm like... on board for this i'm, I'm <laughs> absolutely on board for hating yourself and feeling like the only way to subvert feelings of insufficiency are to contribute to a capitalist machine yeah. I'm on, i'm on board with this conspiracy <laughs> Yeah. So uh, if your boss could convince you that, like, yeah, the things that you like to do are actually like lazy and bad, like it's bad to play video games. It's bad to read books. It's good to do spreadsheets and emails. Uh, And like only when you're doing those is when you are your true self. Uh, So you must sublimate and subjugate uh, your like natural self. Um, I think that's part of where it comes from. Uh, And so I think we learn over time to like not give ourselves permission to actually value and enjoy those things. Um, And a lot of it, too, is like you have to do some of that to survive. Uh, You know, you have to work jobs that pay you money so that you can do the other things. But it's easy to get confused and be like, oh, no, actually working the job and paying the money is the good thing. And having the fun part is like the bad thing. Like that's like sneaking a cookie from the cookie jar. That's like having a little that's a little indulgence for us. Like, no, that's also life. That's also good. You're not supposed to have that. You you 
broken, disgusting creature. Get yourself yeah. back to the desk. Tie yourself <laughs> up you there. Come on, good. do it until your fingertips bleed, you bitch. <laughs> um, I read that the ancient Greek word for work was originally translated as not at leisure. So mm. in ancient Greece, they saw leisure as the set point and work as the aberration. Mm. I must have said this five times, maybe more on the podcast, then went and did a bit, did a bit of digging. Turns out it's not true. Uh, so a really, really great, <laughs> just perfect example of, of, of something I, I would have loved to use as a metaphor. Uh, and, yeah. now, and now I can't. But I can continue. I think it's still, it still is very nice thinking about the way that over time humans have changed their perspective of work. And I mean, it's only been, you know, you can go back 200 years to see a very different sort of approach to work and what it meant, that it was a contribution mostly for survival. It was a, you were connected with your work in a more existential way as opposed to this kind of like dopamine hamster wheel thing mm-hmm. that it's just for, uh, it's for show as opposed to maybe for the honor of your family or the pride in your name or the, the value of your cow when you go to market i don't know you, you, you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah some things even if not uh factually true are emotionally true so uh uh like that uh that greek story but um but no i think this is true that like if uh if your job can convince you that like this is actually the way that you express yourself um and like this isn't just for money like this is who you are um, then like you give them a very powerful tool of controlling your behavior that it, that like you allow them to convince you that like, no, what you really like to do, uh, like when you are your true conscious and good self, like what you really like to do is like be on time and you like to go to meetings and like, uh, you like to make projects come in under deadline. Uh, and yeah, it, I think it'd be much easier if you showed up and it's like, this is a thing you do for money. That is our relationship that we have. Um, like you're not here to like attain self uh, uh, self actualization uh we do hope that you will leave on time and go do the other things that like this job allows you to do uh, i think a lot of people get stuck doing the thing that is next to the thing that they want to do confused as to why it doesn't make them feel good like the thing that they really like what do you mean next to the thing so like um if you uh if you really if you really like doing graphic design uh like if you really like painting um you can get convinced that like no what you actually like doing is making logos uh, and you could be like, man, why doesn't this like feel good? And it's cause like, it's not the thing it's like slightly to the left or to the right of the thing that you really want to do. And you might be better off doing something totally different. Uh, so you're not confused about like why this thing that like kind of looks like the thing that I want to do doesn't oh, feel good. Yeah. So it's bleeding over. There's a concept from Stephen Pressfield's the war of art where he, he calls those shadow careers. He mm. says the number of people that he met in LA who were failed actors or, or always wanted to become an actor but ended up becoming an agent because it was tangential mm-hmm. enough to the industry that it made them feel like they were maybe in the thing but it wasn't the thing and they were just going to have this existential yearning for the rest of time. Yeah. it. Uh, I don't have data to back this up. I just have a deep gut sense, which is honestly like what most scientists have anyway. But I have this feeling that like if you actually can't do exactly the thing that you want to do, you might be better off doing something that is so different that you don't get confused as to what is your labor and what is your pleasure. Oh, dude. Um, turning, turning a love into a labor is one of the quickest ways to be able to destroy it. I've seen so many of my friends that love to train, become a PT, launch an online course, teach people how to launch online courses. And then before you know it, they, they're a, you know, a million miles away from being a PT. Yeah. The thing that they enjoyed yeah. was exercise. And now what they do is teach people online who want to teach people to build a business online <laughs> to coach people in the real world so you, yeah. that story of the lady that started the bakery and wanted to build it into a business and then five years later she hasn't baked a cake in yeah. god knows how long and doesn't know anything that's going on but she's a great business executive with a very successful bakery it's yeah yeah it, it, we we really do sort of overcomplicate things the numbers is this because of the, the amount of degrees of freedom that we have in a, a that we've been afforded in the modern world do you think yeah, I'm sure that's part of it. Uh, part of it, too, is being expected to live a certain life. Um, you know, I mean, my my friend who uh, wants to dig ditches and hang hammocks, like people expect him to do a thing. You know, he has a college degree. Um, you look kind of bad if you don't do the thing that rises to the level that you're supposed to be educated for. Um, when, in fact, like the whole point of acquiring those additional opportunities 
is like to use them to make your life better. Uh, like th- this is like the mistake of spending your whole life, like increasing your bank account and then you die and you're like, ah, good. I like died with like a large bank account. Uh, like I won. Uh, it's like, man, the money was for making your life better. Uh, same too. Like the degrees are for making your life better. The success is for making your life better. Um, not for like, uh, like increasing the success meter more. Talk to me about Sir Francis Galton. <laughs> Uh, this is a guy who lived uh, in the 1800s, uh, the second half of the 1800s, who um, was kind of one of the first modern psychologists. Um, he did a ton of stuff. He invented uh, like nature versus nurture is a, a, a phrase that he coined, um, invented what we now know as correlation, um, weather maps, uh, the scientific, the, the scientifically correct way of cutting a cake was also him. Arithmetic by smell. He just got, there's like this whole list. The first map of Namibia. Um, super interesting guy also had some beliefs that I think now we would find, uh, a little distasteful. Um, but I got to reading his autobiography and it was just extremely entertaining. And so I, I wrote a, a review and a, and a post about it. Uh, oh, also the biggest thing he invented was eugenics. I should have, shouldn't have left that off the, <laughs> <His> <laughs> crowning off the achievement. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and so I wrote this post getting at like, okay, what was this guy's life like? And how did he get to this point where he made progress in all these different fields and invented this thing that he didn't see that, uh, you know, only about 100 years later, people would recoil in horror at what he thought would be uh, a, quote, permanent success when he established, like, the the chair of eugenics at University College London. Um, and just trying to get at, like, why is it so hard to see into the future morally? Uh, you know, he saw into the future in statistics, in biology, in meteorology, um, but not in morality. Uh, and so I was trying to get to the bottom of that. Just to list some more of his achievements that you put in the article, tries to learn arithmetic by smell, succeeds. How do you do that? Yeah. Uh, he like trained himself to associate uh, numbers with smells and then like put the smells together. And I mean, this is purely his claim that like he felt the association of like the so he, you know you associate like one smell with three, another smell with uh, two. You put the smells together and you feel five. Um, wow. This is a paper in Nature, like the premier, well, now the premier um, scientific journal. Worships a puppet to see if he can convince himself it has godlike powers. Succeeds. Yeah. This, too, is just a story that he was like, you know, some people get obsessed with, like, you know, cult figures or whatever. Like, could I understand what it's like to do that? And he's like, yeah. So I found this puppet. And I just started, like, worshipping it. And he's like, yeah, I really came to feel like uh, <laughs> like it did have those powers tries to consciously control all of his automatic bodily processes, nearly suffocates. Yeah, uh, yeah, because he was like, oh, I will think every time I breathe. I feel like th- this guy is sort of a dude who, like, never stopped being sick. Like, these are the things that you do. <laughs> like, before someone is tamped down on your imagination, and you're just like, whoa, my body does stuff. Like, can I make it do stuff? Yeah. What's, hang on, what's animal magnetism? He hears that animal magnetism is all the rage, learns it in secret, it's illegal, magnetizes 80 people what is this yeah this is basically like a, a version of hypnotism right um and like putting people in a trance and getting them to do stuff uh which was yeah he went to vienna at the time and like yeah it was illegal to do this uh and he's doing it to 80 people replaces the blood yeah. of a silver gray rabbit with the blood of a lop-eared rabbit to see if it can still breed it can tells himself mm. that everyone is spying on him to see if he can make himself insane succeeds Makes yeah. a walking stick with a hidden high pitched whistle inside it, takes it to the zoo and whistles at all the animals. Most don't care, but the lions hate it. Yeah. What uh, a guy, man. Yeah. That's what science was like. And, you know, for the even the stuff that I disagree with him, something that I like about him is that he has the spirit of experimentation. Um that like even if you are, you know, the most established scientist in the world, like nobody does stuff like that anymore. And it's not because we have all those things figured out. Uh, like, I think there are still like kind of wackadoo things that you could do to learn about the world that people just kind of don't do because they look too silly or like, ah, well, you can never write a paper about that. Like you can't do arithmetic by smell. Uh, another thing he did early on, he was, uh, like a trainee in, um, basically a surgery, like a doctor's office. And he just decided like, I'm going to take a little bit of every medicine alphabetically. (laughs) And so he just goes down the list, uh, until he gets to this thing called, uh, croton oil. Um, and he has such bad diarrhea (laughs) that he, um, never does it ever again. Uh, and he stops his alphabetical experiment, but this is a dude who was willing to, you know, screw around and find out. He put his uh, body on the line for for science. Uh, For science. You gotta respect that. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay, so rolling the clock forward, he then develops eugenics, which as yeah. soon as you start to think about nature versus nurture, you realize that there are certain things that you can perhaps breed into or out of humans. Yeah. Um, why is it the case that somebody who is incredibly smart and is able to come up with a concept isn't able to foresee the potential ethical implications of it? Is this a a unique byproduct of eugenics itself? Is eugenics particularly ethically murky or is there something else Mm. more broad going on? I I think it's basically that he never really had an opportunity to speak as equals with someone who would be on the losing side of a society based on eugenics. Um, So, I mean, you know, for all his scientific experimentation, he's mainly talking to other gentlemen of science um, who are all you know, born into wealthy estates. Like the reason they can do this Victorian science is basically because they inherited enough money that they never had to work. And so they can screw around all day whistling at the lions at the zoo. Um, but if you had to talk to somebody who was maybe born uh, into less wealth who uh, and you go like, oh, they don't seem very fit because uh, they, they didn't inherit all this wealth. You might start to realize like, oh, maybe, you know, there's more than just genes that determines um, your outcomes. And maybe there's something uh, wrong about uh, like subsidizing rich, successful people to uh, to like marry each other and like preventing uh, poor, less successful people from marrying each other. Uh, I think basically just like no one was around to call him on it. Um, and to be fair, it's it, it's not just him. Like, like decades go by before anybody, as far as I can tell, really writes something mainstream questioning the ethics of eugenics. At first, it was all about, well, we don't think it'll actually work. I mean, that was the main thing that he was arguing with uh, with people because he's kind of the first person to say that uh, human traits can be inherited. Um, and so a bunch of people are like, no, they can't. Or like, oh, well, you could never – like getting certain people to marry would never do anything. And so this was purely a scientific question uh, of the people who are doing science before someone enters the conversation who's like, hey, guys, this seems like maybe a little bad. He was Darwin's cousin? Uncle? Yeah, like second cousin. Yeah, but like – yeah, they're they're connected if you go back a few generations. Yeah, I mean, this Victorian era, say what you want, man. This Victorian era, I've read a ton of books about Darwin, seems so cool. They've got yeah. these <laughs> weird rivalries, this this particular guy that they would both hate to see at other conventions and everyone would know about the, the rivalry between them. It's so fun. I, I really, I don't know if there has been a dramatized version of Darwin's life. I don't know how exciting it would be to see a bunch of stuffy, stiff upper lipped British guys just saying mean words at each other across a smoke-filled room. But I would watch it, and I think that it's pretty interesting. I do wonder... Yeah, I, it, it's very interesting to work out why someone, how someone could be so smart as to come up with it and to not see it moving forward. I also remember something in your article about three generations of imbeciles is enough, and it was a landmark yeah. case in the US, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah, this is this is a case about uh, uh, forced sterilization by the state um, or basically they decided that's fine because I mean, the reason he goes like if you have enough stupid people in a row, according to the the metrics of the state, like, well, you've lost your like right to continue reproducing. And, and this is the like very unfortunate place that we get led to when we're like, OK, these intelligence tests are everything that a mind can do. And like we should interfere in uh, in how people reproduce with one another, one another to like make us better off, uh, which are the unfortunate parts of his legacy. It, so, it can't all be, you know, whistling at lines. Is there a precedent in the U.S. for forced sterilization that still exists yeah. on the books? Um, I, I don't know whether it's still law or not, but I do know as recently as the 2010s, there were cases in California of women, you know, always unclear when you're in prison, like to what extent are you being told versus like pressured or whatever, but into getting tubal ligations, which is basically steril- sterilized. Um, and so like this is going on pretty recently. Um and uh, and I looked at some polling. So uh, so another thing I study a lot is changes in public opinion over time. I haven't seen recent polling on uh, on people's opinions on things like forced sterilization. But even in the 90s, um, uh, people were saying like, oh, no, that kind of thing like sounds fine. Uh, I mean, I want to go on the record like I don't think it's fine. I don't think the state should be sterilizing people. We should not put that power in the hands of, uh, uh, of the state. It just yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of stuff is, is fairly recent. What do you think humans misjudge when it comes to working out what other people want to talk about in conversation? Mm. Uh, so I have some studies where one of the things that people were asked to judge was um, 
when did the other person want to go? So I bring people into the lab. They talk as long as they want to. And I ask them, like, was there a point at which when you wanted to go? Like, tell, tell me when that was. What about for the other person? Um, and what I find is people are really bad at knowing when the other person wanted to leave. So when they guess, they're off by about half of the length of the conversation. So if we talk for 20 minutes and I try to guess when you want to go, I'm off by about 10 minutes in either direction. Um, people tend to underestimate a little bit how much the other person wanted to talk. So it's not like we always think, oh, all these people want to talk to me. In fact, we're like a little bit underconfident. But what this leads to is that conversations generally don't end when people want them to, uh, which is what that paper is about. So, um, so when we ask people like, okay, your conversation went on 25 minutes uh, or 20 minutes. When, when did you want it to end? People tell us uh, the difference between when I wanted it to end and when it ended was, again, about half of the length of the conversation. So they wanted to go somewhere between 10 minutes or continue on for another 10 minutes. Uh, and part of it is because they don't know when the other person wants to go. And the other part is people very rarely want to speak for the same amount of time. I imagine this comes up a lot in your line of work. Yeah, it does. Some <laughs> some episodes some episodes seem to really be rounded out quite nicely around about the hour mark. On average, and, then, and again, I'm the common denominator here, so it's probably me. Um, one ten to one fifteen for me is really really nice, and it's just finishing on a nice peak, and it's maybe just starting to drop off a tiny bit, and you go bang, there it is. Uh, yeah. But then there's other times when I can sit down with somebody and I go, all right, this is I'm I'm not even half, not even getting going, and you've hit the hour number. So there is so much of a very interesting interplay, um, rhythmically, energetically, in the way that you speak to other people. So that's in terms of duration. What about in terms of content? What do people mistake yeah. about what others want to talk about? Yeah, there's some other research on this that people just are bad at knowing whether people like want to keep talking about this, this topic or want to move on to some other topic. Um, so it's not in like some particular direction that, that like, oh, they want to talk about football, but I thought they want to talk about basketball. It's more just like, I really don't know what they want to talk about. Some other research suggests that people underestimate the extent to which others want to have deep conversations with them that, you know, we get stuck having shallow conversations um, that how's the weather and oh, that's a nice shirt you're wearing. Uh, thinking that, oh, the other person doesn't want to talk to me about like uh, the problems that they're having in their life right now or the things that they're afraid of or the things they're really excited about because like, oh, I don't know, that's just kind of scary and uncomfortable when in fact, like, no, people are actually more willing than than you think they are to have those kind of conversations because, I mean, when we all stand around being like, oh, man, isn't small talk bad? Uh, like, we mean it. Like, people really do want to actually have deep, deeper conversations with people. I learned... I was reminded in your article about that series of 36 questions. Mm -hmm. It's an ascending scale of intensity that yeah. experimenters use to get people to be friends. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. This is the fast friends paradigm. And so there was that big New York Times article about it. It was basically adapting those questions to, uh, to, be, for, um, uh, to be more for friendship. So, so the way that that works is what we call um, like increasing reciprocal self-disclosure. Just basically the idea of like, I tell you a little bit more about me. I like open the door a little bit. You tell me a little more about you. You open your door a little bit. And like we go little by little until, you know, we lower our guards and the door, doors are open and now we're willing to, to chat Discuss to each other. Discuss our chronic flatulence together. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Dude, that does some bad farts recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you can get there in just 36 questions. <laughs> yeah. One of my friends, George, sent me a question the other day, which I put in my newsletter and I thought was absolutely fantastic. And you're the first person that I've spoken to since he sent it to me. Question was, what is currently overlooked or ignored by the media? but will be studied in future by historians. What do you think? Mm. Anything come to mind? Yeah, uh, I would say the professionalization of science, um, that we have this idea that like professionalization always good, um, like making people professional, that sounds good. And we don't realize that, that professionalizing something actually makes a certain set of trade-offs. And basically you lower the ceiling in order to raise the floor. So by professionalizing something, you know, you rein people in and so you prevent the very best from doing exactly what they do in order to prevent the very worst from doing what they do. In some domains, this makes total sense. Like I want my doctor to be professionalized because like I don't really care about the very best doctor. I mainly want a doctor who's like good enough and isn't going to harm me because uh, sometimes they put me under anesthesia and I don't know what they're doing, right? And it's really hard for me to judge like which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. 
I don't feel that way about scientists. I think science is what I think of as a strong link problem where like we progress at the rate that we make our most important discoveries and do our most important work. And so I don't want to trade the best stuff in order to get rid of the worst stuff. I think the worst stuff basically doesn't matter. Uh, it just fills journals. Nobody ever looks at it ever again. Uh, and it's like very weird that we live in this period where science is super professionalized and we're mainly focused on like how do we stop like the these random bad studies from coming out that no one's ever going to look at again. Uh, if you think about Galton's time, like there wasn't the standardization. Like, I mean, the dude was wandering around, like swapping blood from one rabbit to another and nobody was like stopping him from doing it. Uh, what was that? What was that thing where wasn't he tutored by his sister who had yeah. some bad spine problem? So she yeah. had to lie on yeah. a plank of wood. This yeah. guy had like, the weirdest <laughs> life ever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this isn't to mention like all the, the, the travels that he did in Southern Africa where, uh, or all the travels he did all over the world, where he's constantly running into, um, uh, quarantines, uh, because there's pandemics going on. And so reading this, like I, I read that mainly, uh, you know, a year and a half ago when there was a lot more of this going on and being like, whoa, like so little has changed or like we're back at this moment, um, where, and a lot of it too, is like this theatrical element of like, I showed up at this place. And like, because I was kind of prominent, I was invited to like dine with the mayor of the town. But then the newspapers were like, mayor of town breaks quarantine to talk to I'm like, man, this is all just wow. <laughs> the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Dear God. <sighs> what, um, you, you looked at some stuff to do with why we forget so many of the topics and bits yeah. and pieces that we learn. What, what's the 30,000 foot view on that for someone that's not being indoctrinated? Yeah. This is just the idea of like you spend a lot of time in school learning a lot of stuff and then like pretty quickly you remember almost none of that stuff. Uh, so like what's it, kind of what's that all for? Like what are we doing here? And I mean there's the question of like okay well what are the like educators intend to do? But I think there's a different question of like well what is the mind doing? Um, which is I think not holding on very tightly to any individual fact. But getting some abstract sense of the way that things are, which I call a vibe, basically. And these things actually stick for a long time, maybe forever. And so the important things that you're learning in class aren't necessarily like what Mesopotamia was or like how many you know, U.S. representatives there are. It is a sense of like, oh, history is interesting or like history is complicated or history is very long or like there are many ways that humans can organize themselves into different societies. And like the way that things are now is not the way that they've always been. And they can be other ways. Um, uh, and these are like the kind of like deep truths that no one ever really tells you specifically, but like you are learning them by sitting there. You can get other vibes too. Like education is stupid and like, it's just a matter of satisfying the whims of the teacher. Um, uh, or like, you know, it's cool. Like, uh, like this sucks. I want to be anywhere else. Like these are vibes too. And I think these are actually the more important things that we get when we are in education rather than like all the PowerPoint bullet point stuff that we're going to forget as soon as the test is done. And so, I, so, I mean, I, I am partly an educator. And so I think a lot about like, what is the thing that people are getting? Like when I speak, like when I write, like the important stuff, isn't, uh, like this thing buried in this paragraph. Like it is basically an approach to life. Like it is a, it, it is a philosophy that's kind of hard to put in any one place, but that you get this emergent property from spending a lot of time in it. What would be a more direct way for people to learn vibes. <laughs> I think kind of the thing is like, you can't get there direct. Like that's the whole point is it, like, you can't hack the vibes. Um, I think you can do a better job as an educator of thinking about like, what vibes am I giving and thinking about like, Oh, the most important thing isn't that they remember what ancient Sumer is. It is that they like, remember that like human history is very long and complicated. And like, sometimes people do really good things. And sometimes people do really bad things. We're capable of all sorts of things. None of those things are going to be like the lesson of the day. Uh, like they're going to be the thing that like kind of sticks on the, your mind's ribs when you leave. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of think it can't be sped up. Uh, it can only be appreciated. It's a little bit like what we were saying earlier on to do with a lot of people have to go through the success in order to be able to say that success isn't the thing that was going to make them happy. That yes. it's a, a lesson that can't really be expedited in advance. And uh, I wonder whether... I don't know. Maybe it is just the case that you need to sit down and bang your head off the wall about the four principles of uh, whatever is appropriate accounting. I remember, dude, I remember in first year of uni and I lived in this 
set of halls of residence that was two and a half miles away from the university. So we had to get a bus in. We had to get a bus to nights out. We had to get a bus to lectures. And it was the morning of this... <laughs> The morning of this exam, my housemate, who was a big stiff idiot, but was a lovely guy, hadn't done any revision. And he said, what do you think is coming up on the exam? And I said, I think, think it's going to be the four, the four principles of accounting or something like that. I can remember the conversation I had with him. I can remember thinking, wow, I, I actually did even my lackadaisical version of, of revision makes me feel like super smart compared with you. And I remember that one of them is prudence can't remember any <laughs> any of the others i don't really even know what prudence means when it comes to accounting yeah I mean, I mean you're accounting for the figures what are you being prudent about the figures either there or it's not i have no idea how it wraps in and this is <laughs> what 16 years ago now probably yeah 15 or 16 years ago and i have no idea about the rest of it yeah but i do remember what it feels like to have a sense of guilt around your lack of pre preparation and realize that yeah. there is way deeper to fall because there is always somebody who is yeah. less prepared than you. Yeah. Yeah. And like, if your professor had stood up and said, like, there's further, to, like, there's always someone lower than you, like that too would go the way of prudence. It wouldn't make any yes. sense. Yes. Uh, yes. Interesting. Uh, like you, you had to experience that. I mean, to your point, like I did a, a master's degree at Oxford, which I remember none of any of the stupid pointless lectures that they had what like the thing that, that I remember from there is living in this terrible apartment. And I was one day in the basement kitchen, like eating Weetabix in the morning. And, uh, it was like toward the end of the year. So they were bringing people in to like, look at the apartment. And some students came down the stairs and like, I'm there in like my t-shirt and like my boxers or whatever, eating my cereal. And one of them looks around at this kitchen. that's like not well lit. It's dank. It's bad. And is like, I can never live here. I'd kill myself. And then they left. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> what, and, like, what was the, uh, symbolic lesson that you took away from that? Um, I was like, uh, I think it's like, man, you could be at what some people consider the best university in the world and people could walk into the intimate parts of your life and say that if they experience those things, they would kill themselves. So like, think about like whether all this legible stuff matters a lot or whether I want to be living in such a way that when people walk into the room, they go, oh, I'd like to do that too. <laughs> wow. So it, what it ties into really nicely and is a concept I learned from Tim Ferriss called the good shit sticks. And you mm -hmm. talk about this as well, that the stuff that really resonates with you, that lights a fire inside of you, that feels uh, existentially important in some way, you don't need to have a Anki space repetition, Ebbinghaus forgetting yeah. curve hack for this. You're gonna not going to, you're going to be in, unable to stop thinking about it. Yeah. That's how important it's going to be to you. And, you know, as somebody that has crushing volumes of high pressure content on a daily basis, that's absolutely the best way to do it for me. Now, that could be a cope, right? Because if I had a better personal knowledge management system with an externalized second brain and my notes were all organized, I would definitely be able to recall more. But certainly if you're not someone who is geared in that sort of a way, and if you are, you'll already know. You'll already be the kind of person that's probably got a perfectly designed notion database with all of your lessons tagged properly and whatever whatever and this isn't right if you're a med student i understand that you actually need to know what all of the terms mean like that's why anki yeah. was created for those sorts of people but for the most part if it's just you're a curious individual that wants to pick up stuff i wouldn't stress yourself over oh god i'm so stupid i can't remember things i can't recall things my recall dude for so long, especially toward the end of my 20s, probably because I partied a lot during my 20s. I think I was <laughs> suffering with some sort of acute brain atrophy. It was so embarrassing. I used to I used to hate it because I'd look up to these mammoth titans of recall in the world of philosophy or, or personal development or productivity, and they'd just be bing, bing, bing. All of these studies would come off, and it would sound so perfect and flowy. And it just took a good bit of time for me to realize you, you need crushing volumes of content in order to be able to retain even a modicum of something that can mm. hold half a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think there's this general tendency toward thinking you can optimize your life in such ways that like, I just need the right systems and like, then I'll remember the right stuff, which like there are things on the margins that like, yeah, I don't know. You should like a calendar is helpful. Like some kind of way of dealing with email is helpful. Um, but, but like take that philosophy too far. Uh, and this is a piece of it that I've been working on. Like, you end up being the person who like you've optimized everything and you're miserable. Um, like there are things that you just can't optimize because they're, they're like mysterious or you have to experience them. Um, but like uh, I, I think about when when people like go through a terrible breakup and you're like, you know, you will like, don't worry, you'll feel better. Uh, like there isn't 
really like a series of things that you can do to like make the feeling better happen faster. Like you just got to live the day and then the day after. And then like it happens as if by magic, but it eventually does happen. There is no way of speeding it up. Uh, and the more you try to speed it up, the more you slow it down. Uh, and so like this, this like tendency toward optimization, I think is like helpful when kind of corralled rather than like the, the feeling of your life. Thinking about this new venture that you've been going through for the last couple of years, writing your Substack, what are you doing? You're sitting down, you know that you need to write something because it's been however many days and you've got a deadline that you've set yourself totally arbitrarily. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing that you found is an effective way to get past writer's block and creative creative sort of blocks? Yeah, I do a few things. One is whenever I feel stuck, like I can't get this sentence right, I can't get this point right. I asked myself, like, what would be the like, what is the most honest thing that I want to say right now? Like, if I faced no consequences for what I was going to say, like, what would I say? And often I find that, like the reason that uh, I I can't write this is because I'm like, I like feel like I shouldn't say it or I shouldn't say it this way. Um, so sometimes it'll come out. Sometimes I'll be like, oh, I actually don't know enough about this yet. That is what because what I would say is I don't know or like, nah, I'm kind of like glossing over some stuff here. And so then I go back in uh, and research more. Another thing is it is like I try to give myself too much time, but like these things take time to bake. Uh, and it's like you can't bake cookies faster by like cranking them up to 4000 degrees and like cooking them in a second. I mean, there are like machines that are meant to do that. Right. But like you can't do that in your oven. Like they just take the time to bake that it takes. And I feel the same way when I'm like baking an idea for experimental history that like if I try to speed it up, I'm just going to burn it. And like it's going to taste bad. I'm not going to like it. Uh, and so I have to give myself the amount of time that it takes. And if I'm not done in time, then I'm just not done in time. Um, cause I'd rather give people something that they'd like to read than like the, like an email that they, that I think they should receive. If I try to complete it too quickly, then I'm going to burn the idea and it's not going to taste good. I really, really like that. <laughs> I really like it. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's a very strange, especially for me, right? Cause podcasting as a medium, I always have a, a sparring partner, except for it, maybe one episode in 30 I do on my own. But for the most mm -hmm. part, it's me and and somebody else. So my my motivation's externalized, my preparation's yeah. externalized. You know, I get to read all the stuff that you do. I don't have to generate. I have to generate nothing, right? Apart from half baked mm -hmm. takes about stuff from fifteen <laughs> years ago that I can't even remember on a bus to uni. Yeah. So it's a very different sort of medium. But I've I have started writing more and more frequently at the moment, and it is one hell of a battle at times. Yeah. To sit down and to get things out, and I do. Um, for the guys that are full-time writers that are cranking out thousands and thousands of words a week. I mean, do you know Brandon Sanderson? Have you heard of him? No, no. So he's a, a fantasy author. There's a really cool post on Reddit, which any sentence that begins with, there's a really cool post on Reddit is followed up by a <laughs> sentence, which is nothing cool at all. But yeah. really cool post on Reddit, and it explains the number of words or pages per year that this guy outputs compared with the other most prolific mm. page writers within the fantasy genre. Fantasy being known as a genre, which can be a bit verbose, right? It's, yes. It can it can be padded out quite nicely. I remember yeah. once in uh, The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, he spends like two full chapters explaining this kid's walk to work where he goes to play his like lute or something. And he's describing in like intense detail the type of cobblestones he walks over. Anyway, um. This guy is five times as prolific as the next biggest fantasy author in terms of output. And he's he's got secret series that he just hasn't ever got around to releasing. And then he'll just pull the pin and they just appear on Amazon. And they're all really, really good, or at least most of them mm -hmm. are good, the ones I've listened to. So, yeah, when I look at people like that and realize how challenging and incompetent I find sitting down to write, yeah, it, it, it does feel mm -hmm. like a, a very different sort of very different world. Yeah. And, uh, and like, I think part of it is figuring like, okay, what's the niche that you're good at? Like some people are like crankers and they just like, they're like a fire hose of content. Um, and like, that's good. Uh, like I want to be, I don't know what's it, uh, rather than a fire hose of content, like a, like a bunch of water balloons. Like I want them to go off. Uh, I don't want them to be like, oh man, I'm soaked, but in a good way, I guess. And then like, I'll be like, I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> like I'll throw another one at you. Uh, and like, I want what I write to be something that people look forward to rather than like, oh, it's always the hum in the background. Like I'm never going to out Buzzfeed Buzzfeed. I'm never going to be better than cable news at like filling time. Like my comparative advantage is like 
baking things until they are to me like perfectly baked or as close as I can get and then putting them out into the world. Yes. Um, it's, I mean, it's a good measure of how excited people are to read your stuff or to watch or listen or whatever, which is how many people open the email. Yeah. How many, how many people, when you send out that newsletter or whatever it is on a Monday morning, how many people actually open it? And, yeah. uh, yeah, that's a really nice heuristic. You just want people to be excited about your work. You don't want people yeah. to feel obliged to read it. Oh, yes. I'd better, I'd better read Adam's next piece of work. I mean, God, <laughs> what all the, my boss is going to shout at me if I don't. And you don't want it to be laborious. Yeah, that's a very, very nice heuristic. And I love the idea of allowing something to bake until it's done. Because if you do rush yeah. it, it's just not going to taste as good. And also, when it comes to the stuff that we do ourselves, it is, for the most part, the deadlines are arbitrary. I think it's important to, you know, create some constraints or else you're just going to Parkinson's law yourself into a one article lifetime, which is, yeah. you know, may maybe not totally great. However, most of the deadlines, especially the things that we learn from school, probably don't port across that well, especially when the difference between your work being really, really nicely done and being unnecessarily rushed could be a lot. That being said, I think that this is a mature create a problem rather than an immature create a problem. Mm. When you're more on the immature side, you just need to iterate, right? Until you've done mm -hmm. whatever, 200 repetitions at the thing that you're trying to do, mm -hmm. I just get it out. You know, if it is it is it <laughs> is it 95%? Yeah. Is it 65%? It kind of doesn't matter. No one's yeah. reading it anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I think early on focus more on the sort of explore and then on the back end you can uh, learn to bake a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. P part of that same mindset comes from, uh, so I, I teach and perform improv comedy as well. And like, yeah, what you do early on in classes, is like you do a lot of terrible scenes, uh, like nobody sees them until later. Um, but then later you get this sense of like, or I always had the sense anyway, that like, why would people come and sit and watch something that I'm making up in front of them? Like it better be worth their time. Cause like they could be at home, like eating Pringles and watching like any movie humankind has ever made, like any TV, it's all at their fingertips. There's a lot of good stuff that you could do. So like, why should they come here? Uh, and like, I do actually think there's good answers to that question. Like there is something that can happen in a room that like cannot happen in your living room. Like there's a moment that we can create like when we're on stage and actually it's much better being there when it's good um, than, uh, than, you know, rewatching Breaking Bad. Uh, and I feel the same way about writing that like, yeah, why would people write, read my stuff rather than, you know, you could read anything that any human's ever created. I'm like, well, it's because like only I could write this thing because it's like it required me to have all these experiences. There was no way of speeding up the production of this article. Like I had to live for 31 years and, and like think these thoughts and put it out. And I do think like this is better than other stuff that you can read. Um, and like I'm just foolish enough to think that. Uh, <laughs> That's the problem. And this is a piece of advice I gave in a TEDx talk two and a bit years ago now. Uh, if you try to be your version of somebody else, if you mimic or copy too much from some other creator, the very best that you can hope for is being the second best them in the world. Like yeah. if, I, if I if I want to be Joe Rogan, at best I can be the second best Joe Rogan on the planet, which you know is not necessarily that bad of a position given how yeah. successful he's been. But it's no one near as good as being the first best you, and and yeah. you can actually be the second best you to somebody else if you're not careful like yeah. you can you can uh mitigate and dilute down the essence of the work that you do because you're trying to adhere to some arbitrary set of rules that you've decided you need to follow uh on a similar point talking about why the general public is so stupid seems to be very trendy <laughs> and this is something that i've noticed super super trendy to discuss about how society is going down the toilet and everybody is just an idiot why do you think that is so popular yeah part of it is uh you know it makes it makes you look smart when you call other people stupid like there's been some psychology research on this at least that people think that this is the case um another thing so i, I didn't write that in, in, in that piece but part of my dissertation work was on people's perceptions that people are less good than they used to be like less kind less honest less nice and and then actually i went and tried and like try to find any evidence that this has been changing over time. Like, and there's no obvious, like objective measure of people's goodness. And I mean like everyday interpersonal things. I don't mean like, did you murder somebody yesterday? Uh, but all these surveys, like 
how often do you encounter incivility at work? Like, uh, did people treat you with respect all day yesterday? Like, did you do this nice thing? How about that nice thing? All these things are flat over time for as long as we've measured them. But people think that they go down, 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 all these different ones. Uh, and I think that comes from two phenomena. One is um, when you look out on the world, when you read the news, it's mainly about people being bad and dumb. Uh, like, that's what makes he headlines uh, is like this person killed that person and like this person embezzled some money. And so every day you look out in the world and like it looks bad if you look at it that way. But there's a phenomenon uh, in the memory literature called a fading affect bias, which is just basically the badness of bad stuff fades faster than the goodness of good stuff. And you can run this study on yourself that like, you know, if you remember things that happened to you when you're 18, like the bad things now probably don't feel so bad unless they were like really terrible. And the good things like still feel pretty good. Uh, so something like, oh, I got turned down for prom. Like now it's like, oh, man, isn't that funny? Like being a teenager. Right. And the good stuff that like, oh, man, I had a really great prom. Like still feels kind of good. And this is true on average for how people's memories work over time. And so if you put that together with the fact that like every day it looks like people in general are bad. But there's this memory bias where like it kind of seems like there was less bad in the past. You can get this illusion of a decline and you can get it for things like morality. You can get it for competence, intelligence. Um, but it's all illusory because like these things are actually really hard to measure over time. And anyone who's like, I definitely know how it's changed is like fooling themselves. What is the reason for this asymmetry between how sane we feel we are and how insane everybody else feels? I had this discussion last night. I, it always keeps on coming up, this weird imbalance between what we see yeah. of ourselves and what we see of everyone else. And often I think we believe that we see the world in a sane way and everybody else yes. is, is very, very odd. Yes. There's this thing called naive realism, which is just the idea that like my eyes are little portholes out of which I see the world and I'm just seeing it how it is. Like there's no interpretive step after the, the information gets to my brain and up to my consciousness. Like that's just what it is. When in fact, there's all kinds of interpretive steps. I mean, even basic sensory perceptive stuff that like the world that you see isn't actually the world that's out there. Like your eyes and your visual cortex make it useful for you. Um, but that also happens with higher level stuff. Like the ideas that you hear that when you hear them, you're like, oh, no, bad idea. Oh, no, good idea. Like all that's pre-processing that's done under the hood. Like you didn't consciously arrive at that decision, but it feels like that's just the way that it is. So when you look out at other people who perceive the world in a different way, it just seems like they're mistaken. And when you're like, oh, no, actually, dude, it's a it's this way. And they're like, no, it's not. You're like, oh, well, you're dumb. Because, like, it's just obviously this is the way the world is. And if you disagree, like, you just must be, like, something's wrong in your head. Um, so I think I think that is part of it. Uh, another part of why we feel this way about people we don't know very well. But, like, when you're closer to someone, you can give them more leeway. They're like, I know why you see the world differently from me. Because I know you have all these complicated differences in experience. This is why, like, we cut our friends a lot of slack. But when you don't know someone, you're just like, yeah, dude, you're just a dumb person. And it's this phenomenon of psychological distance that like the closer you are to something, the more detail in which you perceive it. And the more detail in which you perceive someone, I think the more slack you give them. But if someone's just kind of like this blur to you, this blob, then you're like, no, nah, there's no complication to people in general. They're not a bunch of, you know, flawed humans doing the best they can. They're a bunch of like idiots and evil people. Um, and when you get closer and closer, like when you those people become your friends, like, no, actually not this one, but all the other ones are. Uh, so there's an illusion that keeps getting pushed back. I wonder, well, I can see how that might be adaptive for us to have that, that the people that you're closest to, you need to kick off at the least frequently. You need to not find a problem yeah. with every single thing that they say. Whereas if it's somebody else, maybe from, let's say, a different family within your tribe or from even a different tribe, you can afford to judge them much more quickly because the risk of not doing so would be quite grave. If this is the smoking gun that this person's a malevolent narcissist, you want to be able to figure it out pretty quickly. But if you have this yeah. broader sample of behavior, maybe you can give them a little bit more room. Yeah. You can't think hard about everything. Like you can't uh, like go through a deliberative process about everything that comes to mind. Like you have to be very uh, selective about that. So it makes sense that like the people closest to you get the most de detail about them um, because we have to deal with them the most. And the people farthest from you get blurrier and blurrier. I mean, it, it works the same thing way in your visual field. But, like the things that you pay point your eyes directly at have the most detail. And it's hard to tell, but the further and further out you get in your visual field, like eventually your color vision goes away. Like all of that is, is just abstract. None of it feels that way. You have to look at like visual illusions that make this clear. Um, uh, but it's the same thing. Like you like the whole the whole part of your visual field cannot be the point that's most in focus. Like you have to be selective. Uh, I think the same thing works in mind. 
correspondence bias. This is the idea that that other people's behavior flows from their personality rather than their situation. Um, so you see somebody who's ticked off and you go, it's because they're a mad person, not because they're in a mad situation or a situation that made them angry. Um, and there's there's this kind of other part that often gets lumped in, this actor observer bias that we do this more for other people than for us. Because you perceive yourself in the most detail. So I know all the stuff about like my mitigating circumstances and why I do what I do. And I go, oh, well, I was pushed this way and that way. Um, and like, that's why I did it. It's not because it flowed from my uh, like the person that I am. Essence. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so I told this story in, in, the, in this post of like the first time I got to New York where, you know, I'm walking through LaGuardia. I'm like looking for a taxi. It's, and a woman comes up and she's like, hey, do you need a taxi? I'm like, I sure do. Like, thanks, kind New Yorker. Like people were wrong about people in this town. Look at all these friendly people anticipating my needs. And she's like, come with me. And we walk outside and then we walk across the street into a parking garage. And I'm like, this doesn't this isn't where I expected the taxi to be. And then we get to an unmarked car. I'm like, usually taxis are yellow. <laughs> and she's like, get in. And I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm in a bad situation, but I don't want to be impolite. I came all this way and I did say that I would go with her. And she's like, OK, you can sit in the passenger seat. I'm like, oh, all right. And so I had this plan that like if she tries to kidnap me, I'll just grab the wheel and I'll steer us into a building. And then she'll be dazed because she's middle age and I'm 18 and I'll dash from the car and I'll get my luggage out of the back and then I'll run away. And like all those, that story might make me sound like I'm a stupid person, but each of those things felt like I'm in this kind of weird situation. Like I don't want to harm this person. Like I don't want to be mean. Um, and like each individual's decision that I make doesn't seem that stupid. Um, but it, yeah, but when, but because I'm in that situation of like, I know everything that went into it. That's similar to, is it the fundamental attribution error? Or it might even yes. be the same yeah. thing by a different yeah. name. Yeah, Diff different word for the same thing, yeah. Yes, I thought so. There was a period in the world of productivity about four to six years ago, a guy called Shane Parrish, blog called fs.blog, Farnham Street, and he wrote a book of great mental models to think by, and, and it, it did very, very well, and he's a super, super smart guy, and he's been on the show. The rationalist movement as well that Scott Alexander and Elliot yep. Yukowski were a big part of, lesswrong.com, then turned into Slate Star Codex and Astral Codex 10, all this stuff, which you'll be familiar with. There was a period in my life, and I think most people's lives that have come up through that corner of the internet, where I thought, if I just know the name of every cognitive bias, <laughs> if I've just brute forced myself to rote memorize every single one of the cognitive bias list on Wikipedia... I will transcend humanity yeah. and become an awakened being. Why is it not the case? <laughs> I think it is the same problem of trying to optimize your life in ways that can't actually be optimized. So like if we go back to, you know, you go through a terrible breakup and you're like, oh, actually, uh, I'm doing bad affective forecasting. Like, I think that my uh, my emotions will continue longer than they actually do. And now I ascend into the realm of the person who, like, isn't affected by my... It's like, knowing how the thing works doesn't mean you can just open it up and change it. Uh, like, our my, minds, like, they don't have a hood that you can pop open and, like, fix the carburetor. Uh, so some of these things, like, yeah, it does help. Like, okay, I know what sunk cost fallacy is, and now I know better to spot it, and, like, I don't do it as much anymore. Um, but some of these things, like, there isn't a way around it. Uh, and in fact, like, thinking that you can get around it, it keeps you stuck in it longer, because now you're thinking, like, why haven't my bad feelings gone away? I mispredict how long they're going to... Uh, yeah. And so I think when you look at these at rationalists, which, like, I'm a very adjacent to that part of the internet, I think, like, look around, like, do they seem happy? <laughs> like, they they seem, like, very stressed out and anxious all the time because yes. they're just trying to think correctly. Well, I suppose the other thing that you layer on top, and this is one of the curses of knowledge, is that you actually can layer on shame if you're not mm -hmm. careful. Because now not only did you succumb to your fundamental attribution error or whatever, you multiplied by zero accidentally, uh, but now you have to shame around the fact that you do this bias before you did it and you still did it. So now you feel like yeah. like, like an, in a self-imposed idiot as opposed to just an idiot that's, that's circumstance, circumstantial. Yeah. Why can't I make my brain work right? Like I'm thinking all the right thoughts. Like why don't they work? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Dude, I, it's, a, it's a real um, – I feel that's another thing that people just need to go through. You know, if you're mm -hmm. if you're 20 and listening to this and thinking, oh, I'm going to check out fs.blog, 
Please do. It's a fantastic yeah. repository of all of these different cognitive biases. Enjoy the next three years yeah. of learning them and, and creating Anki uh, note cards to be able to try and do your Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And then when you're 26 or 27, you can say, God, I'm glad that I went through that. I don't remember any of it. And But you will remember the vibe. You'll remember the yeah. fact that yeah, yeah. we are less rational than we think we are. We do yeah. not know how rational we can be. And cognitive biases are not fixed by learning cognitive biases. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, what's that for us right now? Like, oh, dude, I think this future- all the time. I think this all the time. You've stepped into, you've hit one of my traps, uh, which is, what am I going to look back on in five years' time and think, you knew this 10 years ago. Why weren't you mm. stopping doing this five years ago? Yeah. I, th- I sometimes think that like there's really only seven things to learn in life, but you can only remember one at a time. And just life is the process of forgetting one and remembering another. Um, and I wish I could tell you what they were, but I could only remember one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, if you ever look back at the things where you say, what would you have, what do you wish that you 10 years ago would have known? That's pretty good advice for how you're behaving right now. When I write that mm-hmm. out for myself, I think, yeah, right now Chris needs to listen to this as well. That's not that's not that's mm-hmm. not advice for him forever ago because we are we re- were cursed or blessed to repeat the same patterns over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you know, you're filtered uh, restricted by I know that this is a problem, but am I going to act on it? Am I nervous about acting on it? Do I feel stupid because does this feel comfortable to me somehow? Does this type of trauma or difficulty somehow feel familiar in a way that's actually going to keep me stuck in it even more uh yeah it's um it's very very interesting looking at the progress of personal knowledge development over time dude adam i i really really love your work everyone needs to go and check out your sub stack where should they go where can they follow you and harass you on the internet uh experimentalhistory.substack.com um and you can shout at me there and i will hear you dude i appreciate you thank you Thanks for having me. It was great fun. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.